Hello and welcome to Banking Transformed. I'm your host, Jim Roos, owner and CEO of the Digital Bank Report and co-publisher of The Financial Brand. In the soon to be released book, The Rise of Techno-Socialism, authored by my longtime friend, Brett King, and his co-author, Richard Petty, the premise of the book is stated well when it says, whatever political ideology you align with, mankind is coming to a fork in the road. Climate change, emerging artificial intelligence, social and economic upheaval, and the clash between patriotic nationalism and the inevitability of globalism are coalescing into a crucible. The question becomes, how will mankind emerge from this battle? I'm joined today by Brett King, who I mentioned is a great friend of mine. He's the, the author of the book, Rise of Technical Socialism, along with Richard Petty. And he also is the author of many books on banking, Banking 2.0, Banking 4.0, um, and Augmented. You know, we're going to be discussing the items that are brought up in the book, as well as how it impacts our daily life in and out of banking. In the soon-to-be-released book, The Rise of Texas Socialism, authored by my longtime friend, Brett King, and his co-author, Richard Petty. The premise of the book is stated well when it says, whatever political ideology you align with, mankind is coming to a fork in the road. Climate change, emerging artificial intelligence, social and economic upheaval, and the clash between patriotic nationalism and the inevitability of globalism are coalescing into a crucible. The question becomes, how will mankind emerge from this battle? While the perspectives provided in the book will certainly be debated, the reality that technology will be the center of all these changes can't be disputed. I was fortunate enough to get an advanced copy of this book, and every page makes the reader think about what the future may look like, what is inevitable, and what can be altered if humans and technology are deployed the correct way. You know, as I mentioned, I'm so fortunate to have Brett King on the show today. I'm sure that anyone who is a listener of Banking Transform podcast has heard of Brett King, seen him at one of his hundreds of events he has spoken at, or read one or more of his books on the future of banking. So, Brett, welcome. And let's start with the most basic of questions. While your book is not the first that isn't focused entirely on banking, what made you decide a book um, to author a book that could be best described as a look into the future of mankind? Well, Jim, you know, I, I've always been, you know, very interested in the future. Um, you know, we, we, we're recording this on the day that William Shatner just uh, went into space. Yeah. And so, um, you know, um, I grew up on Star Trek and, and um, you know, sci-fi. I've always been a big sci-fi reader. Actually, my first book I wrote, which wasn't published, was a sci-fi novel. Um, and so um, I've always... Um, you know, been been in a hurry to get to the future, um, but one of the you know things that sort of really I carved out a career for myself with is is sort of helping business people and those around me understand the impact of technology on their lives, on their businesses, and so forth. So it's fairly obvious that you know when these two worlds come together, or these two sort of um, you know uh, thought paradigms come together, um, namely you know what's going to happen in the future and how technology impacts, it would would lead me to the question of how is society going to adapt to these changes? And um, you know, in doing my research for that, I found found very little, little research that really looked at sort of conventional, um, you know, ideologies around politics and socioeconomics, even economics themselves, that had a holistic view of, of the future. Um, you know, we see movies and, and series all the time depicting um, some of this stuff, but a lot of the time it's just sort of a, an extension of the, the way we view the world today, when in reality, the sort of changes we've got coming just in the next 30 years will really challenge our most sacred ideologies in respect to, you know, um, politics and economics, and, and, and that needed to be written about. And so, so as we discuss a little bit about the actual name of the book, it could be considered a bit provocative in and of itself. Can you discuss a little bit about Techno socialism as a as a name of a book, 
Right. So the book, The Rise of Techno-Socialism, obviously, yeah. you know, we, we chose that name, um, you know, because it was a little provocative, um, because we want people to read this and we want people to discuss this and debate this. Um, th this is not necessarily um, about presenting a... a um, a, a clear outcome that this is definitely what's going to happen. In fact, in the book, we talk about four potential futures. Um, and there are different ways we probably could have framed um, the, the one of those quadrants, which is techno-socialism, um, you know, and I debated this with many of my friends, you know, should it be called uh, techno-humanism or techno-collectivism or something? Um, but uh, you know, we want people to read this and debate it. We want people to challenge our assumptions. We want people to think about these issues. And so, it, you know, it was, you know, we chose that name, um, you know, with that in mind. Having said that, it's not a political book. No. Um, you know, uh, obviously some people will feel some of the suggestions in the book, like how we talk about universal basic income and the need for universal services at an economic level and so forth. Some people will feel those issues are political. But we talk through those issues in respect to what are the options and what are the choices humanity has and why that we feel the, this is the optimal path. Um, but we do talk about four distinct possible futures that humanity faces. So I know you wrote this book at what might be considered the best of times and maybe the worst of times. While the issues of environment, technology, social injustice, political upheaval, economic inequality, all became front and center issues with the emergence of the pandemic. Determining the impact of these issues was really a moving target. How did you and Richard determine when to stop writing the book and start moving to mm. publishing? Because I, I know we, I asked you this question more than a few times going, how can you stop when the target keeps on moving, but did it really move? Well, you know, we, we, did rewrite the book, obviously, as the pandemic started to impact. Um, you know, we we had planned to launch this book, um, you know, uh, sort of mid last year, yeah. right? Um, and so, with the emergence of the pandemic, that obviously changed a lot. And you know, when you read the the very you know, start of the first chapter, you know, we frame, we frame that by, you know, in terms of what was happening in respect to the pandemic. Uh, but at the same time, um, you know, the, the major issues that we outline and in respect to the economic uncertainty that, you know, the planet faces today. So namely, you know, the pan, you know, rolling pandemic. So we don't think this is going to be the last one. Um, in, income inequality and, and wealth inequality, which is becoming a massive problem globally um, and it, and and is it at its most severe in the United States as an example um, and then the impact of artificial intelligence which is going to be in sort of a, a gradient over the next uh, um, you know 10 to 15 years in particular and then climate change on top those four issues really don't change in terms of the fundamental challenges they present to humanity. And so um, the pandemic, all that did is give us a lot more fuel um, for the conversation because it, it, it gave us a glimpse into some of the, um, you know, clear shortcomings of capitalism as it stands today and the the problem of inequality you know when we look at inequality before the pandemic the richest one percent of americans uh, owned about um uh, owned as much as the bottom 70 percent today it's the bottom 90 percent that's how much the wealth of the richest one percent yeah. in the states has increased during the pandemic so Getting into your book, and, and again, the book, it, it, I, I, would, I would hesitate to call it a page term because you end up resting on a page to take in everything you say because it is a lot of new stuff. But you, you mentioned, as you mentioned, major challenges facing not only the U.S., but the world as a whole. From your perspective, which of those challenges is right now to you the most daunting? So, so here's the biggest problem that we as humans have to address is that these changes that are coming, we can see them coming. Right. We're arguing about 
you know, how they're going to affect humanity. And that that very issue, the fact that we argue and debate about this rather than plan, um, you know, uh, sig- you know, seriously for these changes means that when they do impact us, they impact us with far greater, um, you know, uh, range of impacts than than they need to be. The the two the two that you know are obviously going to change the way humanity lives philosophically and you know in terms of um the systems are obviously ai and climate change in in the process of that we have to solve inequality and these other issues but ai as an example is completely going to change the way we think about work and its role in society climate change is a problem that we cannot fix at a national level we have to have a collective approach we have to have a a species-wide, planet-wide approach to this. And the more we debate, uh, you know, about national interests in that, the less effective we are at really sort of planning and dealing with those things. So those two core issues, the role that work has in our society and the way economics will change as automation, large-scale automation impacts us, and the need for us to really have a sort of collective approach across the planet um, to tackle climate are the two biggest philosophical changes we'll face. So of the most significant challenges, which you believe are not, it may be more predetermined than others. Which ones do you think, if we really focused quickly, we could have the biggest impact on? Mm. Well, I do think, uh, you know, I'm a techno-optimist, and, and so that really comes out in the book, I think, you know. Oh, yeah. um, Richard, who's my co-author in this, is an economist, and, um, you know, obviously he looks a lot more at the structural elements of the economy. You know, so, for example, things like the the Chinese central bank digital currency, the E1, and how that will affect us. But, um, you know, for me personally, um, I do think we have the technological capability to solve a lot of the problems associated associated with climate change. Um, But we have to think very differently about investing in these things. Um, I think you know, when when we talk about these sorts of issues, for example, building, um, you know, uh, technology for carbon sequestration, extracting carbon out of the atmosphere, or building seawall defenses around New York, Miami, Shanghai, Calcutta, you know, these cities that will be inundated with sea rise. The, the first statement you're going to hear from people is, well, who's going to pay for this? Um, and I think um, at, there's going to come a point in time where that question is meaningless if we're going to have true Action. So I do think that we can solve these problems, but I, I think we have to think about them very differently from an economical perspective. Well, and what's strange is we see some major regional differences in the way different areas of the world view, let's just take climate change. You know, there's even the financial institutions, the way they deal with it is that in, in, in France, in the UK, there's a big focus on being carbon neutral. You don't see that even being in the the asterisks within financial institutions of the U.S. It's just a. I mean, I take it you you know it's a big issue, but how do we get more consensus around the importance of this and not make it such a political issue? So I think one of the arguments we use in the book is a fairly simple one, which is, um, you know, the debate over whether climate change is man-made or not, it, it, it doesn't really matter. Um, because the need for us to adapt to these changes is going to happen regardless. So, um, you know, let's first of all not, you know, get wrapped up in that debate. Is it man-made or is it as a natural thing? Instead, let's say, what are going to be the outcomes of these changes on society? And the biggest you know, like, you know, 570 cities inundated by sea rise by 2050, um, between 300 million and a billion um, eco-refugees displaced because of these things and because of food scarcity as a result of rising temperatures that change, um, you know, the, the way we use um, or land use in terms of farming. Um, you know, that is something that... Um, every nation on the planet is going to have to deal with at some point in time. You know, let's let's take the worst case scenario, a billion eco-refugees, right? One eighth of the planet displaced by this. You can't just say, let's close the borders and ignore this problem. It's, it's too big a problem to do that. So this is really the philosophical piece is that at some point, you know, we have to ask the very real question is, 
know, what's what's the purpose of us being here? You know, what is the purpose of humanity? What's the purpose of our economies? Is it to create GDP growth, market growth, you know, um, you know, return uh, profits to shareholders? Or is it simply um, a mechanism to enable the or to support the needs of citizens and, and create prosperity more, more broadly? So you, you reference in the book in, in a number of different places where because of the fact we have masses of people that are not as well off educationally, economically, from a the hunger standpoint than others, that revolts are going to happen. Um, and th- that re- revolt will happen either regionally, globally, or, or on a local basis. Is, is there any way to avoid, to some degree, I mean, and maybe it's because of my, my living in the United States where I, I feel like we always think we're going to avoid the big problems until one takes us all over, like the pandemic, but what is it going to take for governments to realize that the, the masses are getting bigger, the, the inequity is getting wider, and we're not, we're not coming close to solving it? Right. Um, so, you know, it, you're, you're absolutely correct. Um, and the really interesting data point that we learned in researching this was uh, around the nature of that response that we see globally in respect to economic uncertainty and the way that plays out in, in terms of protests. So um, in the first 20 years of the 21st century, we saw a 200% increase in the number of protests globally, where people People are dissatisfied with their governments, but a thousand percent increase in participation. That's from the average of between 1950 and 2000, um, which blows blows my mind that we've had that sort of collective response. It's not it, it's not limited to the United States or Western economies. This is a global effect. Why are people protesting? Because they're uncertain about their future. All of these things that are happening mean people are like, well, we don't know what's, there's uncertainty, what's going to happen? And so ultimately, when you have then AI and climate placed over that economic uncertainty, um, you're going to have either people will get to the point of revolting because the system isn't working for them, um, or... Um, you know, we have to have some way of reducing that economic uncertainty and those concerns. And that's really the the outcome. Now, if you look at just the inequality piece that you mentioned, uh, no nation on earth has ever faced the inequality that the United States faces today and got through that without wealth distribution um, changing it. Um, and so that either happens through legislation or it happens through revolution. And so I know which one I would rather, <laughs> you know, I, I don't really want you know, to see a revolution in the United right. States, but, but that requires very different policy thinking. So before we take a break, I have one more question. And, and that is, as with all of your books, the amount of data and research shared to support your themes is Massive. I mean, it, you, there's not a single page that doesn't have a major reference to, to statistics data that's out there. Is there a section of the book that may have not been in your initial drafts or thinking that emerged because of the interrelationships with maybe the other themes? Or did the book come together as you imagined it would 18 months ago? Oh, um, no, there was always data that I found that surprised me and took me in a, um, a different direction, um, but um, not, you know, it, 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 in minutia, right. like for example, um, you know, um, the, the UBI thing, universal basic income, um, you know, this has been debated a lot recently, particularly with the pandemic and the stimulus, uh, you know, checks and so forth. Um, but this is one of those things where there were really some surprising outcomes for me, which is, you know, when you look at the research, particularly coming out of like the Nordic regions and, and places like that, where they run these UBI trials, that actually increased people's participation in the economy. Right? And so that's one data point that would surprise most people, I think, that they were where they would think that if you 
pay someone a monthly stipend, then they're just not going to have to work. They won't work. Well, um, you know, when you when you have people that don't face the pressure of having to put food on the table, um, and you know they have that comfort, then it enables them, you know, potentially to pursue things that they wanted to as an entrepreneurial basis or community service things like that. That was one thing that I thought was um, you know a very interesting um, factoid. The other one was, um, and we talk about this globally, the cost of healthcare is a massive problem. Um, you know, in the United States since the 1980s, it's gone to, you know, like we're talking about potentially, you know, 14, 15% of the GDP focused on these costs. It's extraordinary costs, but there is so much inefficiency in the healthcare system. And I'm not talking just in the United States, I'm talking globally. Um, you know, almost one in two diagnoses is wrong. Um, you know, you look at the administrative costs in the United States, 40% of healthcare costs is administrative costs. And so there are so many areas where we could reduce um, government, we could reduce um, the administration of these systems, and then that allows us to provide actually better care than what we can do today at a, at a dramatically lower cost. Um, and so that's pretty profound. Well, and, and the sharing of data, you know, it's interesting because healthcare is very much like banking in my mind that the, the efficiencies and the effectiveness of the industry can be enhanced tremendously by the, the, the sharing of and the depth of data that's shared. Um, when I, we have some friends at uh, an organization that we're both familiar with that had two cases of cancer. And when their team was put on the mission of finding where in the world is this cancer or this ailment being treated and what are the best uses of, of some resources to deploy and say, where can this be done? They found solutions that have been extraordinarily effective. However, yeah. this should be accessible to everybody, not just those that have it. Exactly. And, and it, it's, you know, we're, we keep all the data. Again, it's very much like banking that, Healthcare system holds all the data. They have a ton of data. It's just the sharing aspect, the deployment of that, that becomes a, a major sticking point in much the same way that economic data, um, healthcare data, all, you know, all these things. Again, the technology can really be a savior in, in, a, in a tremendous way. So, so let's take a short break here and recognize the sponsor of this podcast. It's your organization trying to embrace digital banking transformation in 2021? Are you trying to elevate the customer experience? Figure out what technology you want to implement to improve the customer journey. Look at data analytics to really better understand and personalize the customer experience. And you're trying to make it so that more of your employees can buy into and be part of your digital banking transformation. If this sounds like you, I ask you to reimagine banking with our newest podcast sponsor, Microsoft. They give you the opportunity to unlock new opportunities at speed throughout innovative business models, deliver differentiated customer experiences across channels, products, and services, and redefine new ways of banking. Microsoft and its partner ecosystem help banks to achieve differentiation through sustainable growth, streamlining core systems, reducing cost and risk, and delighting customers and employees. If you're in the midst of a journey, trying to figure out what to do next, maybe trying to find out what other organizations are doing to lift up their experience level, I really encourage you to look at Microsoft. For more information, visit Microsoft.com slash financial services. This podcast episode is being presented in partnership with PayPal. PayPal provides access to more than 403 million active global accounts and multiple buy now, pay later offers in a single integration. PayPal Pay in 4 enables shoppers to make purchases in four industry payments. Customers get more buying power and flexibility and merchants get help maximizing reach and revenue. Learn more about PayPal Pay Later on paypal.com forward slash trust. Welcome back. I am joined today by Brett King, author of the new book, The Rise of Technosocialism, 
We've been discussing the book in Brett's perspective on the challenges and opportunities facing the world in the near and long term and the impact of technology on that future. So, Brett, as the book title of your book suggests, each of the trends in the future will be impacted tremendously by new technologies, innovations, and the deployment of data insights. The last time we traveled together, which was a long time ago, was in Shenzhen, China in January of 2020. We saw some amazing deployments of data, analytics, and technology everywhere we went. You discuss this in your book, but how far ahead is China compared to the rest of the world in the in not just the development of technology and data, but the use of these? Well, certainly when we look at artificial intelligence, um, you know, we've seen recent announcements from um, U.S. Department of Defense where they feel that, that China has surpassed the U.S. on AI. Shenzhen is just a phenomenal example of a smart city and dramatically reduced uh, resource allocation costs for emergency services, traffic management, all of those things that we saw as a result of the use of AI. Um, and so there are some really good um examples for us to look at in um, in specific areas um, you know one area that um, that we are going to have to look at significantly in Western developed economies is energy energy use and energy systems um, and so you know we've got some colliding issues there we need battery grid level um, battery storage to be able to store energy um, the, those batteries um, could create massive lithium shortages for example uh, globally so there are a lot of roll-on effects but China, um, generally speaking, the, the really significant advantage their economy has is that um, they have fully embraced the future of, of technology and the role that artificial intelligence will play um, and what it can do to help them from a societal perspective. And that gives them a huge economic advantage in the medium term. Um, you know, they're obviously well advanced in, in financial services, uh, despite the fact that they've um, put some tighter regulations in place most recently um, in respect to um, reduction of fraud and financial crime, um, you know, on payments and so forth. They're, they're well ahead of, uh, most of most of the West in respect to this. But as you said, um, you know, you go to Shenzhen and you really feel it at a city level. They are redesigning the way the city works based on these advances advances in technology. They're getting energy efficiencies, they're reducing traffic, they're reducing accidents, uh, you know, they're improving the uh, um, the response time of emergency services, all, all of these, um, you know, they're improving uh, waste management. Um, you know, all of this is just simply looking at these systems we've had it in place for now a couple hundred years and saying if we were to sort of redesign this from scratch today you know um would would we get a better system and and the answer is fairly clear but infrastructure obviously takes a long time generally to improve and is very expensive so again china's spending eight trillion dollars a year on infrastructure and belt and road right now we're arguing about a three and a half trillion dollar infrastructure bill in the U.S., which will span five years. So they think about this problem very differently. Well, it's interesting, too. And we talked about when we were there that you could feel the difference in culture around exactly. the acceptance of change and the focus on innovation. I mean, you know, we, we visited a campus that had, you know, uh, thousands upon thousands of R&D workers in a city that was built to support one company. That commitment to not only change and innovation, but the acceptance culturally within the people of change and moving forward and not holding on to the legacy. And, and you know, we can go back decades and say well, there's a lot of reasons for that, but that's a major difference too. And you know, this podcast usually focuses on the banking ecosystem. Your book spends a great deal of time talking about the economic systems across the globe and the role of banking. Where can banking contribute to the betterment of society and what is going on and, and where is it going to change the most with regard to existing banking systems and the, the way they're going to become more global in nature? 
Well, you know, obviously we talk about ESG right now and ESG policies and sustainability and, and those sort of things. And so banks can, um, you know, be a, a big part of this where they say we're not going to fund, um, you know, coal plants. Um, you know, we know uh, today um, that between eight to 10 million people a year, um, you know, annually die from um, air quality issues. We have the capability to fix that today. In fact, arguably, we had the capability back in the 1980s to address it. Um, and yet um, there was the, this question about, um, well, you know, the, but the fossil fuel companies are making a ton of money. So let's not disrupt, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the huge capital growth we're having there. And this is really at the heart of what you're, sa you're asking the question about is, what is the responsibility of corporations to be good corporate citizens um, and to make the world a better place, not just, you know, generate re returns and profits? And this is the cultural question I think we're going to have to ask. Millennials, Gen Zs, the alphas, um, you know, I think they're going to think very differently about this. I think they're going to be saying to these corporations, unless you're a good corporate citizen, we're not going to support your brand. We're not going to buy your products. Um, and I think that that will shift naturally over time. But this brings up this very real question at the heart of how we solve these problems in the future is, you know, is capitalism the best model we have or the current form of capitalism, mm -hmm. the best model we have, um, you know, to fix this? Is the free market going to get there on its own? Um, and the answer that, you know, we, the conclusion we come to in the book is no. Um, and um, so we do need to think differently about economics, particularly at a national and global level. Well, it's interesting, Brett, because two things you hit upon. One is the whole focus on ESG issues. Um, Deloitte just came out of a study about um, uh, serving the under underbanked and unbanked and financial institutions rated themselves surprisingly high on serving the needs of the unbanked and underbanked. And, and I was astounded because the same financial institutions don't rate themselves very high in digital transformation, innovation, use of data analytics. And as I peeled back the layers, one of the things that they focus almost entirely on is the improvement of the, the financial wellness of their employees, which is admirable and, and a good place to start. Important. But the reality sure. is, they're doing it because that keeps their employees there longer, keeps them happy and work, makes them work harder. So really, it gets back down to the realities of uh, certainly U.S. banking, which is make it so I'm, I'm more efficient as opposed to more effective. Do you see that this may not take place in the, in the traditional sense of the marketplace taking care of it, or maybe this is going to have to be regulated? And, and regulated to a degree almost exactly opposite of what's going on right now, because right now regulation in the U.S. is protecting banking from outsiders. We're, we're seeing this harder and harder to, to have a fintech get a banking license. We're seeing that, you know, there's more and more protections being put in place to to make it so the banks themselves can can exist as they are, as opposed to moving to where they have to be. Do you think regulations overall have to change? Yes, I, I, I do. In fact, um, I think what we need is we need to start thinking about regulation on a global basis as well, you know, bringing regulatory zones together. We need regulation on artificial intelligence. China is the only nation right now that has any meaningful regulation on AI. Um, and, you know, but we need a global approach to this. We can't be developing artificial intelligence just without any ethical concerns, you know, for example. Um, we also need to think about how we're going to cater for the 50% of employees in financial services organizations today, to illustrate, that are going to be replaced by, um, you know, artificial intelligence algorithms and, um, you know, robotic process automation over the next 10 plus years. Um, and if you, um, you know, if you don't have some sort of corporate responsibility to that or a tax system that says, you know, if you're an organization that's going to increase your profitability significantly by eliminating labor and, and employees from your workforce, what's your responsibility to look after those employees that have lost their job? Um, and, you know, if, if you don't have some sort of regulatory view of this or some sort of um, approach to that at a, at a national level from a macroeconomic 
um, policy perspective, then the market's not necessarily going to do that. And and the reason we know that is um, we can see that the most valuable corporations in the world today, you know, nine of the top 10 companies in the world are technology companies who employ far less people than the blue chip industrials of, of the 20th century. Um, and so we already see labor participation disconnecting from, you know, market level, you know, uh, you know, output in respect to corporations. And that's, that's not necessarily a good thing because it means high unemployment in the future. Now, we do have some new jobs that are going to emerge. But then the other problem exists is we aren't educating our children to do those jobs. And so at the same time as having large scale unemployment from AI and automation, you're also going to have labor shortages in key areas of economic development. Um, you know, that will keep the economy uh, competitive. So this comes back to, you know, good education system as an example. As foundations of everything, isn't it? Education's a foundation. And it, and it can't change overnight, which is which is that long-term yeah. thinking, which is a, a big leadership issue. You know, you talk about the global regulation of the banking industry. Let's go a little bit deeper and say, what about a global cryptocurrency? Um, it's obviously somewhere on the rise in some economies where cryptocurrency, obviously in China, is becoming more and more likely. Um, do you see a, a global cryptocurrency in the in the in our lifetimes? Maybe your lifetime is both to mine, but there is an amazing opportunity here to create some sort of carbon coin, a global cryptocurrency based on carbon usage where your wealth or the accumulation of carbon coins could be based on your individual actions to you know, reduce carbon impact, as an example, right? Um, and so we could think entirely differently about currency and money and the role it has to play in society in terms of motivating good, good actions. Um, so that could drive us to a global cryptocurrency. I don't think it's going to be Bitcoin. I don't think it's going to yeah. be, um, you know, e uh, Ethereum or Tether or, um, you know, Shiba, um, you know, whatever. Um, but obviously the other aspect of this is trade and commodities on a global basis. And this is where, again, China is going to have a massive impact in reframing this. They've got the you know, Belt and Road Initiative, which is going to give them significant trade advantages uh, you know, over the, the coming you know, decades. Um, and they're going to power that with the Yuan the central bank digital currency there. So that is definitely designed to weaken, um, you know, the, the uh, influence of the petrodollar. But, um, you know, I would love to see us think about money and the, it's the role it has in our system very differently from we, we do today. It might be a bit idealistic, you know, um, but I do think there are ways that we could incentivize people in very different manners apart from just accumulating wealth. And that philosophically, I think, is going to be a very important thing that we do. Whether it's corporations or individuals, what incentives can we give people to do the right things that collectively will help us all? Optimal humanity, we call yeah. it in the book. You know, a major theme that continues to come up as we do these podcasts around banking is the challenge of change thinking and or embracing change and legacy leadership. Um, you talk about it quite a bit in your book because a lot of what you talk about is change that need to be made, but the hindrance of people that are already in place in leadership positions or people that are not maybe as, as thoughtful in the area of visionary prowess to, to move us to the next best place. And in fact, in the US, we see that almost every one of the challenges you mentioned in your book, I wouldn't say are being ignored, but certainly aren't getting much play um, with regard to more wealth equity, more uh, diversity, you know, everything from the environment to the economic and um, the economic situation. I'm wondering what kind of challenge is legacy leadership or old style leadership that's right now still very unwilling to change because they don't feel the pain right in their face. How do we change that? So I, I you know, there's two elements. To this one is leadership at a market level 
in terms of leaders embracing technology and, and adapting their business and so forth. And we've talked about the need for that culture internally to having um, you know, technology leadership at the top of the business, um, you know, and bringing in, in, in new skills and new blood. But on an economy level um, or politically, you know, one of the things that's very clear is part of the dissatisfaction we saw behind protests is the fact that it's getting harder and harder to have representative government that's truly representative of people's needs and, you know, their their desires and their positions. You know, we look at, you know, healthcare provision, you know, for example, in the United States and, you know, in, in most cases, particularly for pre-K children and for, um, you know, for poor uh, people and so forth, there's massive support for universal health care um, at, a, at a national level, but it, it doesn't necessarily get through to policy. Mm -hmm. So at the heart of it, we, we had to sort of think about how do you produce more effective government and, um, you know, from a resource allocation perspective and from a policy perspective. And, you know, what we determined is that, and this may take you know, a few decades to get there, um, but that the concept of representative government where representatives determine the laws and determine those policies just doesn't work anymore um, because it's, it's too easy to ma manipulate. And so um, what we looked at as an example is Aristotle's um, uh, story of the stateship. And he argued for philosophers to, to rule, um, you know, ancient societies because these philosopher kings, you know, um, think about the future and think about these different needs. But the other thing that Aristotle argued, as did Thomas Jefferson, actually, is that good education is, the, is at the heart of a citizenry that can actively participate in the political process. In fact, um, Aristotle argued that um, citizenship shouldn't be a right to vote, as an example, that if you want to be in part of sort of setting policy, that you need a minimum level of qualification or you need to be someone that would be directly affected by that policy to really have a dog in the fight. And so um, coming out of that, we research systems around the world where consensus building based on higher uh, um, competency from a um, domain perspective where that had worked. And one interesting example came out of V Taiwan, virtual Taiwan, where they did consensus uh, exercises and they found across the gulf of sort of the left to right political spectrum that they could actually con um, form policy and get solutions far quicker than the traditional system and um, find commonalities. But it did require a certain minimum level of competency to participate in those conversations. When they opened up the d domain of those policies issues to broader, uh, um, you know, uh, demographics and broader universe of people, they found the, uh, the, the consensus building mechanism started to break down. That, that would be interesting. That, that gets into the whole equality and, and education issues. So again, it, it's infrastructure um, as much as anything else. So why, why Thomas, this is, you know, this, yeah, I, most Americans probably don't know this. Thomas Jefferson said public education should always be free in the United States because it was a precursor to your ability to be a good citizen. Um, and so, you know, one of the founding fathers, that was yeah. his position. I think it makes a lot of sense. So, you know, you can get pretty depressed if you think about just the, the negatives of what the future may look like. But your book also provides some solutions, some ideas that you say could be implemented that could 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 actually change some of these dynamics and, and futures. Um, what are some of the solutions that you thought were probably the most likely to be implemented that could really make a big difference in what our future may look like? Well, you know, one of the biggest issues is just more efficient resource allocation. Our current system is in many areas we identified, um, you know, fairly inefficient. Um, for example, you know, we have, um, you know, a government um, in, in most of the world that has a ton of bureaucracy and inefficiency built in. So we argued that small government is much more possible through the application of technology. Um, and that means that 
overall, the economy then has more money to invest in the citizens providing basic services. And so our view is that this technology is applied at a, a state state and national level. And um, you know, if you get better at resource allocation, then you simply have more resources, capital resources to deploy. So, um, you know, for example, in the area of healthcare, we found that we could reduce the cost of healthcare in the United States by 70% over the next two decades with the application of technology. If you can, if you can get healthcare costs down to that level, then it's immaterial about providing healthcare to the entire population for free right. because it's now cheaper than the existing system, far cheaper actually. Um, and, and the same exists for basic services like um, you know, solving the problem of homelessness and access to housing, access to education. If you can make government massively more efficient in terms of resource allocation, then you can achieve these things. But the other issue is we have a lot of inefficiency in the capitalist system. You know, we think about, um, you know, I'm a big fan of Elon Musk, you know, but Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, these guys have enormous wealth tied up in their companies or whatever. That wealth is not deployed efficient, efficiently. We have to wait for, you know, Jeff or Elon to determine what they, they want to spend the money on. Um, you know, Apple as a corporation, $300 billion in cash. That's more than many small nations on earth today. Um, that cash just accumulating in a bank account is not an efficient um, you know, a allocation of resources for making um, life better. And so I think, you know, um, we've seen this argument before, actually, that, you know, you should tax corporations at a higher level so they're incentivized to spend money and invest rather than just, uh, you know, earning huge profits. But, you um, Again, this is a question of philo philosophy, which is why, you know, um, my journey through this book, um, you know, I make no uh, qualms about saying I'm, I'm center left, you know, in terms of social policy. I'm probably um, center right in terms of economic policy. Um, but what <clears throat> came clear of this is that the most efficient form of humanity is where um, we can actually build an economy that allows us to compete for the future and the prosperity of humanity as a whole, rather than competing against each other at a national or, you know, economic or corporation level. Um, that in a fish, that sort of um, that competition may seem as a good way to stimulate innovation, but the the times that we've come together as a human species, collectively in large groups, we show far greater progress in innovation. So the Human Genome Project, you know, the Great Wall of China, you could put that in there. Um, you know, the the mobilization around the world wars. You know, we had huge our, advances our in our um, highway system. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. right. Um, and even the Apollo program and what we're seeing, you know, must do today in terms of the space uh, industry. You know, these are all really interesting examples of when we come together with purpose as a human yeah. species, we make massive advances. When we get into the weeds of competing against each other <clears throat> because of you know, this political, uh, uh, you know, view is better than this one or this economic model is better than this one, then, then it just increases these, these inefficiencies. You know, Brett, it, it's great to have you on the show today. It's also great to talk about a book that I know you've lived with for a long time. And I go back to the, the very first days of you starting to write this book. I know it's the longest it's ever taken to get a, a book out that you've had yeah, your vision on. Absolutely. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell everybody, everyone of my listeners, the book is on pre-order. I'm going to ask Brett how to, how to get the book. But this is a must read. I'll be honest with you, I haven't completely finished it yet. Um, however, it is a very important book because it doesn't hit upon subjects that any of us are highly aware of. Uh, Brett's done a lot of research for us and it allows us to really make our decisions as to what we feel the future should become and what it's going to take to get there. But again, it's an amazing book. Um, it, is, it is a fun Thank book you, because it, it really... It, Keys into your 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 biggest traits, your best traits, Brett. And and as a person, I've known you for a lot of years. And you, you you're right. You grab on the future all the time, but you you didn't just raise questions. You provide solutions. You provide ideas. You provide hope. At the same time, as you know, there, there are parts of it that I have to admit are pretty depressing. He goes, man, this is pretty far away. But you know, we didn't think we'd be able to get through this pandemic uh, the way we have. Yeah. As bad as it's been. 
Um, it could have been a lot worse. Uh, we didn't lose the number of people that we could have lost, even though we lost way too many. And I think the yeah. reality is, if we stay in a crisis mode towards a lot of the things that we have to deal with, ranging from the environment to equality to economic stability, uh, we'll get there. So, so Brett, how do people order your book? Well, you can go to riseoftechnosocialism.com or technosocialism.com and you'll find links to various bookstores around the world. But of course, um, you know, for, for now, if you just go to amazon.com and type in technosocialism and order it from the US site, um, that would be something that will help us in our goal, which is we're going to try and get this on the New York Times bestseller list. So, um, you know, if you can order through amazon.com or barnesandnoble.com in the US, um, you know, that will, that will really help and, us. And and also, Brett mentioned, go to riseoftechnosocialism.com. Um, the video uh, snippets, the highlights, the the vision of the book, um, it, it, it will get you to buy the book, if nothing else, because it um, is really intriguing and inspirational. So, Brett, again, thank you very much for being on the show. It's so, it's, look, it's so nice uh, to have your support, Jim. I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful and touched um, by that. And, um, you know, just like anyone, I just want to make a dent in the world. You know, I just want to do something good for, for, you know, for the future. So thank you again. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks for listening to Banking Transform. Raise a top five banking podcast. I generally appreciate the support you provide over the past two years. If you enjoy what we're doing, please be sure to follow Banking Transform on your favorite podcast app. In addition, please take 30 to 45 seconds to show some love in the form of a review. It means the world to us. Finally, be sure to catch my recent articles from the financial brand and check out the amazing research we're doing for the Digital Bank Report. This has been a production of Evergreen Podcast. A special thank you to our producer, Leah Longbreak, audio engineer, Sean Roll Hoffman, and video producer, Will Pritz. Thank you.